Mike Hogger coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. This uh, is not going to be the last Watchman I ever do on the Rapture. Although, I hope to be doing a Watchman broadcast on the Rapture when the Rapture occurs. That would be, that would be dandy, wouldn't it? Uh, this is the last one of this particular series. We're dealing with the Rapture and the number five. And all through the Bible, I've been seeing this for years, all through the Bible, it's related to this one particular number. Now, there's other numbers that play into this that I, some I've covered, some I haven't. But this one here has just always stuck out to me. From the very first time I started counting things in the Bible, we know that wisdom comes from counting. Revelation 13, 18, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, which is the 666th chapter of the Bible. Uh, he says that uh, Solomon was looking for wisdom. He said, Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find the account. So two places in the Bible telling us that wisdom comes from counting. They're both associated with the exact same number, 603 score and 6. I don't know why. That's just the number that they're attached to. And so I believe that God's word is in numerical order. And I believe that God doing everything that he does in order, there is a certain wisdom that comes from understanding that order. Clearly, God uses numbers in the Bible uh, to convey symbolism of some sort. Uh, the fact that Naaman uh, had to dip in the river Jordan seven times. Why seven? Why not three times? Why not eight times? And did he have to do that? He had to go and dip himself, baptize, in the river Jordan exactly seven times. And see, he kind of, he said, nah, there's, there's certainly got to be a better way to do this. And a servant came to him and said, you know, Naaman, if he would have told you to, you know, go build some great castle, you would have done it, right? Yeah. Why not go try this? This is easy. All you have to do is get down in the water seven times, okay? There'd be nobody looking, be nothing to worry about, just go do it and see if it happens. So he did, and lo and behold, he's got the skin of a baby now instead of a leper. And so the symbolism behind that number we know uh, from Genesis chapter 2, the number 7, that's the last day of creation. God rested on that day. So he established certain ideas with the number 7, that of rest or that of sanctification, because he hallowed that day and sanctified it. Uh, it's the number for endings. That's the end of the week, and a new week is starting after that. So we know with the number 7, the Bible establishes certain ideas and certain symbols with that particular number. And our understanding of those symbols must always come from the Bible itself, not from people like me. No matter how many books are written, we have to go to the scriptures to get our understanding of a particular number. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is probably the best known scripture concerning the rapture. Let's take a look at it once again. Verse 16, For the Lord himself should ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So let's break it down in order. Number one, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout. Number two, the voice of the archangel. Number three, the trump of God. Number four, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then number five, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, again, we're not going to fight over these words. I don't want to argue. I don't want to be contra contrary to you. I don't want to be in contradiction to you. We all have our little rapture theories, don't we? And sometimes those theories are subject to change depending on, you know, sometimes you think it's one way and then you read somebody, you hear somebody, and then you think it's another way. That's been the case with me. I've gone from pre to mid to post to back to pre again. And 
So I don't want to argue over these words. We are supposed to, what Paul said in verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. So what I want to do is be a blessing. I want to use these words and what I'm going to say to be a comfort to you and then to maybe inspire you to go and do your own study of Scripture. You see, I learned that studying the theories of man concerning last day's prophecies, the rapture, the antichrist, the millennial kingdom, tribulation, and so on, studying man is one thing. But then, no matter how well-intentioned, I mean, I think I'm well-intentioned in this study. But am I wrong? Well, more than likely, yes, about something. There's no doubt, and this is now the fourth video on this subject, there's no doubt in my mind that at least on part of this, I'm dead wrong. I don't get it. I don't understand. It's because that I see through a glass very darkly. One of these days, when it happens, I think the shout of the rapture is us going to be going, Oh, we got that wrong, didn't we? Okay? We're going to shout. We're going to realize that God did this thing exactly according to every word in his book. Remember what Jesus says before he comes? This, um, uh, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Now, I don't have knowledge of everything that's in the Bible. Jesus does. He's going to do it exactly according to the book. So there may be things I've missed out, things I didn't understand. So I don't want this to be something that we argue over, something we fight over. I want it to be an encouragement for you to go back to the Bible. If you believe it a certain way, then the Bible says, prove all things. And then hold fast that which is good. I'm saying that because I know that today I'm going to give you a time prophecy. You may have already figured it out. I may have mentioned it a time or two. But I'm going to tell you why I believe what I believe concerning a certain time prophecy related to the translation. And yes, it is based upon this particular number. So we know the breakdown, 1 Thessalonians 4, there's five things that happen here. Let's go to our other verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look in verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Here's the breakdown. Behold, I show you a mystery. Number one, we shall not all sleep. Number two, but we shall all be changed. Number three, in a moment. Number four, in the twinkling of an eye. And number five, at the last trump. So we have the breakdown of in both places the translation of the church is broken down into five very distinct I mean I didn't use some sophisticated algorithm to figure this out I just went one two three four five it was in fact God gave me five fingers to make sure I wouldn't lose count all right gotta make it easy for guys like me and so it very simply understood that there's five things in both of those passages that sort of give you the breakdown of the events, the timing of it, what exactly is going to happen, and so on. When Christ appears in the clouds, both of them say the dead in Christ are going to rise first. So that gives us a certain amount of comfort to know that our loved ones who died in Christ, being saved, they're going, they've been waiting for this longer than we have. So they are going to rise up in a brand new body. Still got that new body smell, all right? It's the old one. So they rise up in a new body, and then probably in a very, very short amount of time, twinkling of an eye, um, we are going to rise up immediately after them. We're all going to be gathered together to be the body of Jesus Christ as he appears in the clouds, with us, remember, we are compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 12 says. I love that, all right? So anyway, that's what's going to happen. And we've been breaking this down. We've been looking at the number five in various places of the Bible. 
And today we're going to focus on one particular aspect of the Bible and the rapture. And that is that that represents our wedding day. We're the bride. Jesus is the bridegroom. And so let's look at famous marriages in history, in the Bible, and see if we can find this exact same pattern. So, we go back to Genesis chapter 5. We're going to notice something. And I didn't, I didn't pick up on this uh, until I started going back over my notes again for this recording. And then it dawned on me, wait a minute. The first time we ever see, you know, the minister at the end of a wedding, I do this every time. It is my privilege to present to you for the very first time, Mr. and Mrs. Michael Hoggard. All right? you ever wonder why, in the age of feminism, why the woman takes the name of the husband? Because back when I was a child, a woman was referred to as, that's Mrs. Milton Hoggard. In other words, the Mrs. of Milton Hoggard. In formal introductions, the wife was introduced not by her own name, but by the name of her husband. So we present to you for the very first time Mr. and Mrs. Michael Hoggard because she now assumes the name, the identity of the husband. See, I'm old-fashioned. I believe it still ought to be that way. And is that some man-made tradition? No. This comes all the way back from the Bible, Genesis chapter 5. The first time Mrs. Adam was introduced that way is in Genesis 5. Look at it. The first bride and groom, Mr. and Mrs. Adam. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. In the day when they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image, and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Now, if you remember, we used these verses early on in this study to establish this idea that the number five related to death. You see Adam's name listed here five times. The fifth time he's mentioned, he's died. And you see that pattern all through Genesis chapter 5, Enoch breaks the pattern because Enoch doesn't die. He's taken into heaven without seeing death. But we look back then on these verses and we see that the introduction of God introducing these two people into the world, she no longer is known by her name. She now assumes a new role. She takes on a new identity. She is no longer just the goddess Eve, all right? She is Mrs. Adam. This is how people used to be introduced years ago, Mr. and Mrs. Michael Hoggart. And you know what? I don't have a problem with that. The feminism of today seeks to make that some evil thing. That's, that just gives men an excuse to beat their wives. No, it doesn't. It's the idea that, remember, Christ is a bride. Christ is a bridegroom. We're the bride. We, when we get to heaven, it's not going to be about us. It's not going to be, oh, look, here's um, the bride, uh, a bridegroom. You go stand in a quarter somewhere. We don't need you anymore. It's all about the woman. That's not how it is. We are taking on the identity of Jesus Christ as his bride and I'm not ashamed of it. Just because the morality of this world has changed, that doesn't mean God's word needs to change along with it. I may be wrong, but I think the King James says that probably better than any other English translation there is out there. It absolutely establishes and sets forth the idea that now Eve is known by her husband. She's no longer Eve. She is Mrs. Adam, proud to take that identity. So, the first bride, 
the first bridegroom introduced to the world as Mr. and Mrs. Adam in the fifth chapter of the Bible. Now, so I, I, when I had that idea, I thought, you know, I didn't see this before. I wonder if there's something else that I missed related to Adam. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2 because the fifth time we find Adam mentioned in the Bible, that's where Eve comes from. Genesis chapter 2 verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. There it is, the fifth occurrence of Adam. And he slept. He took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Again, the fifth time Adam's name is mentioned in the scriptures, we find the creation of Eve. I believe that God speaks in order. I believe God sets forth a pattern of things in his Bible. And when we understand the numbers, we see the pattern. We're going, you know what? I think this is associated with this right here. And if you think about it, Adam is a prefiguring of Christ. Romans uh, 5, 5, I think, establishes that. We have the first Adam and we have the last Adam, which is Jesus Christ. And so we find that the woman that God made for man came from the man himself, but a particular part. It came from a wound in the man. Now picture Jesus on the cross. How many times is he wounded? Well, we have one, two. I'm not going to put my feet up here, but we have three and four with the feet. Then the spear plunged into his side, wounding him where the ribs are. Blood and water issued forth, probably from, they pierced the pericardium, that, water, that sack of water around the heart, and blood and water issued forth. That is where we come from. It is his wound in his side that brought forth the blood atonement for his bride, the church. So we have a, a wound in Christ, the fifth wound in Christ, that establishes and brings forth the church. We also have a wound in Adam, which is where God brings forth his wife, Eve. Something else I find peculiar in this is that the word rib is mentioned five times in the King James Bible. We, of course, we have one occurrence in verse 22 of Genesis chapter 2. The other four occurrences of the word rib mention the fifth rib particularly. 2 Samuel 2, 23, the fifth rib. 2 Samuel 3, under the fifth rib. 2 Samuel chapter 4, under the fifth rib. 2 Samuel chapter 20, in the fifth rib. Now, was it the fifth rib that God used to take out of Adam to make Eve? I don't know. But I just find it interesting. Again, we have patterns in the Bible. Five times the word rib is mentioned. All the other occurrences mention the fifth rib. All right? A wound being smitten under the fifth rib. Now, think of what a wedding is or a marriage. All right? Here you have a woman. You have a man. See, I'm old-fashioned. I think it ought to be a man and a woman, just, just one of each, all right? So you have a man and a woman who, before the marriage, they are their own individual person. They are separate. They now, both of them, undergo a transformation because now people refer to them not just as the man separate and the woman separate, but now, because of the marriage, they are officially one person. Remember, uh, Genesis chapter 2, this is what Adam said, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. The marriage itself is a transformation of two people united together in one body. Do I believe that at the translation that we are going to literally be the body of Jesus Christ, or is that just symbolism? My answer to that would be yes, both of them. It is symbolic, and it is literal in the sense that the spiritual realm is 
way more literal than the realm that you and I live in right now. The Bible says that we are just the shadow of things to come. Right now, we're just the symbol. My marriage to my wife is a symbol of the day when Christ is united with his body, the church. It's not the other way around. It's not that my marriage or that Christ and the bride, that's just a symbol of what we have in the real world. They, what is that they call that? Anthropomorphism. They say that God uh, thought about it long and hard and decided to use words and ideas from mankind to reveal himself. I think it's backwards. I think God is revealed to this world by way of the things that man does, such as marriage and so on. So my marriage to my wife, your marriage to your spouse or whatever, that's the symbol. Christ and his bride are the real. All right? So it's a transformation, and that's what the, the rapture is, a transformation. It's a transformation of a man and a woman now joined together to literally be one body, one flesh, one blood, one person, all right? Gathered together as one man, the Bible says in various places, all right? So we have the first marriage in the Bible, Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 5. Uh, the fifth time Adam's name is mentioned, we established that, that that's when God takes the rib from Adam, closes up the flesh, makes the woman, gives it to the man. So now let's look at, that was the first, so let's look at the last. Remember what Jesus said? I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning, the end, the first, and the last. So let's look in the last book of the Bible, and let's look at the very last bride and groom. Revelation 18. The light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Now let me stop right here and let me set this up for you. Revelation 18 talks about mystery Babylon, 17 and 18, all right? In Revelation 18, God is saying that Babylon is desolate, or is going to be desolate. And it's coming a time when no more will the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride is going to be heard at all. Now you think about it. Because the bridegroom is Christ. The bride is the church. There's coming a time. Right now, this world has access to the voice of the bridegroom by way of the word of God. And the voice of the bride by way of hearing from the church. One of these days, God's going to take the bridegroom, Christ, and the bride, the church, and remove them, come out from among them and be you separate, saith the Lord. God's going to separate Babylon from the church and from Jesus Christ, and no more is Babylon going to ever hear the voice of Jesus Christ, the voice of his church. Now, there's already a lot of people on this earth who never want to hear another Bible verse again. They never want to hear some preacher trying to preach hell to them to make them feel bad. So you know what God's going to do? God's going to establish that. He's going to set forth a time when he's going to remove the voice of the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, and the voice of the bride, the church. And their voice is not going to be heard ever again. That's desolation. You go read the rest of Revelation 18, you'll see the desolation that I'm talking about. But here's what's interesting to me. I, I just kind of counted. The very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, you're going to find the word bridegroom one time. And you're going to find the word bride four times. So let's look at it. Revelation 18, 23, bridegroom and bride. Revelation 21, 2, prepared as a bride. 21, 9, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. 22, 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come. So we have in the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation, the bridegroom mentioned once, the bride mentioned four times, a total of five. 
Let's read those other verses. Revelation 21, 2, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Mm. Verse 9, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Revelation 22, 17, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. You see, the voice of the bride is an invitation. It is, come. If you are hungry, come. If you're thirsty, come. And whosoever will, that's the invitation. That's the voice of the bride. We declare the word of God, the voice of the bridegroom, and we say to the world, whoever wants God's gift of grace, come. It's absolutely free. So five times, bridegroom, bride four times, book of Revelation, five times it's there. So we have now an established idea. We have two witnesses, one in the, New Te one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, they're both establishing this idea of the bridegroom and the bride associated with the number five. Can we go someplace else? Yes, Matthew chapter 25, which is five times five. We have the story of the five foolish virgins, the five wise ones. Verse one, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. And afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now, one of the biggest things that I get from this passage, to me, this is crucial. Right now in this world, the voice of the bridegroom speaks. It is his word. As his word is declared in whatever church, in whatever setting, however it's done. Whether it's even done of contention, where somebody is saying, Oh, the Bible says, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But I don't believe that. They just planted the seed of the word of God in somebody's heart. Okay? It works. Wherever the word of God is proclaimed, you have the voice of the bridegroom. Every time the church gathers together or people from the church declare forth the word of God, you have the voice of the bride being heard as well. And as we learned in Revelation uh, chapter 22, the speech of the bride is, come. Whoever wants to be filled, come. Whoever is thirsty, come, and you'll get the water of life freely. So the voice of the bride in today's world is an invitation. And it's a warning. Because there's going to come a time when the voice of the bride is not ever going to be heard ever again. And in this passage here, it specifically mentioned that a door was shut. You know what I think of? As it was in the days of Noah. Because there was a door on that ark. And for 120 years, that door was open. And anybody could have got on that ark and been saved. God declared to Noah for yet seven days, and I will destroy the earth. And that door remained open for seven days. An invitation for anybody to come. But then when that door was shut, that was it. Because after God's wrath begins to fall down on this earth, the invitation is over. Now, again, I don't want to be contentious. 
But I think it would be wrong of me not to at least say this and for you to ponder it. You may have heard from people like Tim LaHaye, the Left Behind series and so on, that maybe from Jack Van Ippie and others that say, well, you know, after the rapture, then there's going to be a time where you can still be saved. It's just there won't be a Holy Ghost to, you know, keep you saved. And you'll have to be saved by works during that time. And because Christ is gone and the Holy Spirit's gone and everybody's gone. But you can still be saved during that time. And I used to think that. I don't think so anymore. I think we have two witnesses, the ark and here, that are declaring that one day a door is going to shut. And whoever's on the inside stays on the inside. Whoever's on the outside stays on the outside. So regardless of whatever view you hold on rapture and tribulation and beast and all of these things, I think it's wise to consider the idea that at some point God closes the door on salvation. In fact, after the door is shut, you have the five foolish virgins who are saying, Open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore. At some point, the five wise virgins are going to be sealed on the other side of that door with Christ, the bridegroom. And all those who refuse to willingly obey the warning and the invitation are going to be left on the other side of that door. And I think as of that point, it's over with. So my warning to anybody who would listen to this, I believe that there is coming a time when God's invitation to salvation is going to be over with. Now, you might go ahead and believe somebody else who says, well, even after that, you can still get saved. It's just going to be really hard. Okay? If you want to believe that, that's up to you. You know, the Jehovah's Witness, they teach that, you know, you're supposed to live for Jehovah and do all these works here on this earth in order to guarantee a spot in uh, the new heaven and the new earth. And that even after you die, God's going to give you one more chance now. I'm going to give you one more chance. Now that you're dead, now that you see that I wasn't lying, I'm going to give you one more chance now. If you want to be buried in the grave forever, then, then don't do anything. But if you want to live in the kingdom, go ahead and we'll let you come in. I've even heard that Mormons teach that after you die, you're going to get one more chance to be saved. I think that's a setup. I think the devil loves to plan it in people's minds that they can live however they want to live. They can sin recklessly. They can fill themselves with all the lust of this world and live like the devil himself, not heed the warnings of the gospel that after you die, you can still get a chance to go heaven. Because if I believed that, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. My flesh is so wicked, I would be out there doing what everybody else is doing and getting away with because I would be thinking, you know what? Eat, sleep, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die. But even after that, I get another chance. And I'm not going to pass that one up, and that would be silly, right? Or you can believe this preacher here telling you, your invitation to come and be part of the bride of Jesus Christ, accepted in by Jesus himself, your invitation to do that is right now. There may be another one tomorrow and another one after that and another one after that. But the truth of it is, at some point, God's going to shut the door. And you're going to be on one side or the other for eternity. And my advice to you is step through the door while the door is open. Because once it's shut, that's it. And who is Jesus? Jesus said, I'm the one that openeth and no man shutteth, and the one that shutteth and no man openeth. So your invitation is right now. So that being said, we have, again, we have Adam, 
the number five and his bride, the beginning of the Bible. We have Christ and the church as his bride, again, associated with the number five at the end of the Bible. We go to the middle of the Bible, sort of the middle of the Bible, the book of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. We see the five wise virgins on the side of the door where Jesus is for all of eternity. All right? That marriage is going to last. Amen? Then we have, we have another doctrinal teaching out of Romans. Romans chapter 7. Whew, boy, I read this one day, and it was like I was so happy, tears running down my eyes, because I'm going, I get this. I know what it is because of typology. We'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Romans chapter 7. Here we have another teaching related to uh, a woman and her choice of husbands. All right? And we're going to see how it works in the translation. Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. Anybody want to take a guess who that is? that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. You understand what he's saying here? Your, your soul, according to scriptures, is always shown to be a female. Uh, the book of Psalms, David said, uh, he talked about his soul, and he referred to it as her, all right? So think about this. Here you have you, your soul. Right now, it's married to a real evil guy called your flesh, all right? And it's stuck there. As long as your flesh is alive, your soul has to be there with it. And Paul is using, himself is using this analogy of a marriage. But if your old man dies, now your soul is free to be married to another. And that other is Jesus Christ. So, now you're stuck with your flesh. One of these days, the old man's going to die, and you're going to get to pick a brand new husband. And it's identified as him who is raised from the dead. So now you're free and you know that that new husband is never going to die. And the reason why I got so excited with this passage one time is because I knew the story in typology that displayed this. I knew it. It's back in 1 Samuel 25, which is 5 times 5, we have the story of Abigail. And I'm going to paraphrase a lot of this, but uh, we're going to look in verse 41 here in a minute. But Abigail is married to a man by the name of Nabal. And Nabal is evil. He is uh, he's mean. He's vicious. He curses a lot. Uh, he spits tobacco juice all over the house. And um, he looks at other women, and he probably is mean, beats his servants. And here comes David. Now, David is Christ. David comes, and he's asking Nabal for aid. David's soldiers are hungry and everything like that. And David is knocking at Nabal's door, right? Because Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. David is knocking on Nabal's door and saying, my soldiers are hungry. If you'll open up to us, feed my soldiers, because I've been out fighting all your wars and protecting your land, 
And all I'm doing is asking for one meal and then we'll push off somewhere else, right? So he stands at the door and knocks and Nabal says, who's David? I don't know no David. What, you think I owe you favors? I don't owe you anything. Be gone with you before I pull my sword out. Now I'll just, and so Nabal's being Nabal. Nabal is being the typical lost man who receives an invitation from Jesus himself to have dinner with him. And the typical lost man says, I don't want your religion. I don't want what you're selling. I know where your church, I had a guy tell me this. I know where your church is. And if I wanted to come to it and hear one of your sermons, I'll come. Other than that, I don't want to hear it. I was in his house when he told me that. And I just went, I was a young preacher and I'm, I had never been rejected like that before. And I went, okay, then we'll leave. That guy was serious. He was in a fighting mood. We left, okay, in a hurry. We were there to talk to his daughter about being baptized. She had just asked Jesus into her heart. And we were there to talk to her about baptism. And he came in the room. And I started witnessing to him a little bit. And he put us out. That is the last I saw of him or his daughter. What a shame. Anyway, so that's Nabal. David gets ready to kill him, right? David, I mean, David's upset. Who comes riding in but Abigail? You see, your flesh wants to reject Jesus every day, Right? But your soul says, hang on a minute. Uh, Nabal, speak for yourself. I mean, you may not take any of this seriously, but I do. And I don't want to perish. So Abigail goes to David with food and says, take this. I know he's my husband, but he's wrong. And because David had his sword out and he was ready to go kill Nabal. And killing Nabal would have meant that Abigail would have perished along with him. And Abigail says, wherever my husband goes and spends eternity, that's not where I want to be. So Abigail says, David, she's praying to David. David, please, my Lord, please don't do this thing. Here's plenty of food. I'll take care of you. I'll do whatever you ask. I'll be your servant. Just don't go and kill my husband. You know what David said? He put his sword back and he said, you know what? Thank you. Because I went and went and killed your husband and killed everybody in your house too. And you. But since you asked me, then I won't do this thing. You won't perish. You'll live. See, that's the Lord speaking to your soul, telling your soul you're going to live. All right? So, at that time, Nabal's back at the house drinking himself drunk. He's having a big feast in honor of, guess who? Nabal. Got all of his servants there and got all his food and wine and everything, and he drinks himself drunk. And when he wakes up the next day, Abigail tells him what happened. And the Bible says that when that happened, um, verse 37, it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal and his wife told him these things that his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. Now watch this. Um, and it came to pass, verse 38, at about 10 days after that the Lord smote Nabal that he died. So she hear, he hears the story. He has a stroke, right? Lays there for 10 days like a stone. Can you think of a story in the Bible where 10 and the stone go together? The law. Ten Commandments written on tables of stone. That's what it's meant to tell you here. Nabal, just like we read in Romans 7, Nabal is your flesh, and it's under the dominion of the law. And so when Nabal hears that he's got a death sentence on him, his heart turns to stone, and he's there for ten days. He's a picture of him being under the law, your flesh being under the law. So now that Nabal died, now Abigail doesn't have a husband anymore because you can't have a dead husband. Now she is free, like Paul said in Romans 7, free to marry another. You see, if Abigail would have just run off with David before Nabal died, she's an adulteress. Now that her husband's dead, now she's free to marry another. And look, here's, I spent a long time getting to this one point. There's a number five here. 
If you look in verse 41, and she arose and bowed herself on her face to the earth and said, Behold, let thine handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. That's the church. We wash the disciples' feet. Verse 42, And Abigail hasted and rose and rode upon an ass with five damsels of hers that went after her, and she went after the messengers of David and became his wife. The number five. Okay? It's getting, it's getting really good, all right? Uh, I mentioned earlier, and didn't have the verses in front of me, that your soul is a woman. Where is that in the Bible? Psalm 34, 2, My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Psalm 22, 20, Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. The word darling means dear one. And I don't do this much, but this particular Hebrew word is a feminine noun. Same in Psalm 35, 17. Lord, how long wilt thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling or my dear one, from the lions. Again, the Hebrew word there is a feminine noun. So whether it's darling or dear one, or the word soul itself shall make her boast in the Lord, your soul that's why the church is always rendered as, or always figured as, a woman in the Bible. That's how she can be the bride. Because Christ's not a homosexual. He's not a sodomite. He's marrying a woman, and he's not marrying our flesh. He's marrying our soul. We are the bride, the woman, the church. He's the bridegroom. And Abigail goes with her five damsels. The Bible is establishing that number, I think, for, for multiple reasons, but I think it has to do with a time prophecy. All right? Now, let's look at the 55th verse of the Bible. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Paul used that 55th verse in the Bible to explain the mystery of Christ in the church. Ephesians chapter 5, there it is, verse 31. This cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now let's break this down. Ephesians is the 10th book of the New Testament. That's five times two. The underlying quotation is from Genesis 2 is exactly 25 words. Of course, it's from the 55th verse of the Bible, which is 5 times 5. And the word mystery here is the 15th occurrence of the word mystery or mysteries in the Bible. Do you think God speaks in order? I think he does. And I think that there is wisdom to be gained from that order. Now, the fact that the number five shows up in these patterns, that in itself is not established doctrine. In other words, we don't look to these patterns to establish a doctrine and then read other things into it from the Bible. The doctrine is in the Bible, and these patterns are sort of like the organized framework that these doctrines are in. These number patterns support the doctrine. They are not themselves the doctrine. So I want to make that very, very plain. Is that I don't believe in like numerology or some sort of wizardry or witchcraft from these numbers. The numbers themselves don't establish or they don't, uh, they're not established as doctrine. They are the support of these doctrine, if that makes sense to you, all right? Let's look at Joel chapter 2. Because he speaks of the day of the Lord and the blowing of a trumpet and an announcement of a marriage. Joel chapter 2, verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. So what is Joel saying here? At the sounding of the trumpet, signifying the day of the Lord, something's going to happen. 
The bridegroom was going to go forth out of his chamber. The bride's going to come out of her closet. When I read that bridegroom going out of his chamber, I immediately thought of Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Verse 5, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. To me, it's interesting. We have verse 5 where the son is like the bridegroom coming out of his chamber. The very last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness, capital S-U-N, I love this. Shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings? Do you know the word Christ is found 555 times in the King James Bible? We established that, I think, on the last video we did. And all the forms of the word righteousness, such as righteous, righteousness, righteousnesses, and so on, exactly 555. Five times in your King James Bible. So now, we have this idea that the coming of Christ, the appearance in the clouds, us being gathered together with him, not only established as Christ the bridegroom and us the bride being joined together. That's our wedding day. We also see all through the Bible that it's related to this number five or 55 or 50 or whatever form that Jesus feeding the 5,000 I think fits in here too. So anytime you see this number 5 or 50 or you see patterns of that, I think they all sort of teach this same idea. Christ appears, we're gathered together to be his bride, to join with the bridegroom Jesus and so shall we ever be, you know, happily, we'll live happily ever after, all right? But the question then is, why? Why this number five? What does it mean? What does it signify to us? And I mentioned at the beginning here that I would lay out what I think is a time prophecy related to all of this. I call it the days of Noah. So let's look at Matthew chapter 24, because this is where Jesus said, this shall be as the days of Noah. And let's look and see what he said. In verse 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Let me stop right here. Um, I'm going to give you this time prophecy. Now, this has been something that's been in my mind for a long time. And, you know, I've, I've, left it and studied other things, I think, you know, maybe the Lord will change my mind. But he never has. That doesn't mean that I'm right. doesn't mean that I'm wrong. It's just something that stuck with me over the years. But let me make something very, very plain, very clear. I have never known the day and the hour. I do not know it now. And until such a time as the Lord decides to reveal to the world the day and the hour of our Lord's return, I'll never know it. I won't make the mistake that others have made in trying to come up with a plausible theory for the day and the hour of Christ's return, only to be proven wrong every single time. I mean, you think about it. Everybody that's ever predicted the day and the hour of the rapture, they none, none of them has ever been right. And God won't let them be. And it's no different with me or you. I mean, I've tried little calculations. In the past, I've tried little theories. Oh, maybe it's based upon this. Maybe it's going to be this feast day or whatever. And people have brought to me over the years their calculations for it. And I just don't, I don't pay attention to it. I don't believe it. I'm not supposed to. And I'm not ever going to teach something that I'm going to say this is the day or the hour. But it's just like, you know, God telling Noah, you know, um, for yet seven days. Um, it's like the sons of the prophets, 50 of them, who knew 
that Elijah was going to be taken away that day because they told Elisha, do you not know your head's going to be taken away? Yeah, I know it. So they all knew, okay? And I think there are some things that we can know, including this particular time prophecy. But it doesn't establish the day and the hour. I don't know it. You don't know it. We're not going to know it until such a time as the Lord decides to tell everybody. Okay, just want to make that clear. Let's move on. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and doing what? Marrying and giving in marriage. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, let's break this down, what Jesus said in this passage. Number one, they were eating. Number two, they were drinking. Number three, they were marrying. Number four, they were giving in marriage. And then the fifth thing that happened is Noah entered into the ark. Now, to me, it's interesting. There's five things here. And to me, it's interesting that marriage is part of that. So it's Jesus himself that is associating these days of Noah with marriage. All right. So let's go back and look. We're going to be in Genesis 7. You open your Bible up, and then I'll put it up on the screen so everybody can see it. Genesis chapter 7. Let's look at the exact days that are mentioned in the Bible as being part of the days of Noah. Genesis 7, verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, the Bible is very specific, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Now you read here, this is my little note, the opposites and the number 40 hint at the invasion of the fourth kingdom. Now I've mentioned this before and I'll probably do another study on this sometime. But the very day that it started raining, two things happened. Number one, windows of heaven open. Number two, fountains of the great deep. Those are opposites, aren't they? Forty, did God have to say 40 days and 40 nights? Isn't it sort of understood that 40 days includes the night as well? But he specifically said 40 days and 40 nights. Why? They're opposites too. The number four here, I think this points us to the coming of the fourth kingdom, which, number one, the windows of heaven are going to open and God's going to kick out a third of the angels. They're going to fall down to the earth like rain. Then he's going to allow Satan, I think, the star, with the key in his hand to open up the pit so that these devils can come up out. And that's in Revelation chapter 9. It's at the blowing of, guess what, trumpet, fifth trumpet, okay? We're going to go there in a minute because it's the exact same time prophecy. Exact same time prophecy. So you have the establishment of the fourth kingdom and you have the opposites, rain falling down, water coming up, and that takes place for 40 days. So for 40 days it rained and for 40 days this water came up from the depths of the earth which we know that water is there science has already looked down there and says yep there's enough water down there for that so we know the water's there all right so that takes place for 40 days at the end of 40 days it stops raining but the water keeps rising up after that for how long verse 24 the waters prevailed upon the earth and hundred and fifty days. And then we look in Genesis 8, verse 4, and the ark rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. So, day one, rain's coming down and the floods came up and the ark starts rising. All right. At the end of 40 days, it stops raining, but the water's still going up for a while. On the 150th day, the waters started going back down. So that's what it says. Um, the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days. So for 150 days, the water level either rose or stayed the same. 
it was on the 151st day that it started going back down. Now the waters aren't prevailing anymore. Now they're waning, all right? They're going away. And that takes uh, close to the rest of a year to happen, all right? So anyway, from day one, and he specifically gives the dates, 17th day of the second month to the 17th day of the seventh month. That's five months. Divided up into 30 days per month, you have 100, you have specifically mentioned 150 days. By the way, it's not in my notes, but I'm going to throw it in here. I think there's a connection. I don't know exactly what it is. But the waters prevailed 150 days, and there are exactly 150 psalms. If you've read the Psalms, you know that oftentimes the writer of Psalms refers to the floods, waves of water compassing me, being drowned. I would have died. I would have drowned in these waves and this water rising all around me had it not been for God's salvation. Okay? I don't know the whole connection. I just think there is. Maybe God intends for us to have one psalm a day or something like that. I don't know. But anyway, for 150 days or five months, the water is covering every inch of earth that there is. It isn't until the 151st day that the water starts going down. 150 days, five months. Revelation 9. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. Exactly. And their torment was the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. To me there's something interesting here. Let's just a lot of things interesting here because I end up here a lot in a lot of my studies. You probably have noticed that. One of the things that's mentioned about these uh, locusts that come up out of the ground is that they have stings in their tails. What does that sting represent? 1 Corinthians 15, O death, and it's in verse 55. O death, where is thy sting? And then it says in verse 56, the sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. Remember Nabal? His heart turned to stone for 10 days. You remember the fourth kingdom itself? It's sitting on its feet and its ten toes are that kingdom, part of iron, part of clay. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's the mingled kingdom. And the whole image rests upon those ten toes, doesn't it? So what does the stone cut without hands do? It goes and destroys not the head, not the chest, the ten toes. Because the strength of that image is the ten toes. So that image, think of it representing the man of sin and the strength and what's causing him to stand is the power of sin. And the strength of sin is the law, Ten Commandments. So what happens when the stone cut without hands, Jesus, destroys the ten toes, the law? The entire image falls. Death being swallowed up in victory at the end of five months. Now, 
There's one verse I'm going to give you, and then I'm going to close. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 5. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. It's five things that he says here. After you have suffered a while, make you perfect. After you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Now again, there is an idea that the church will not suffer anything or be part of any prophetic thing prior to its rapture, the translation, and then you're going to have the coming of the fourth kingdom, revealing the Antichrist, and so on and so on. And again, I'm not arguing. I don't want to fight. I don't want to debate. But there have been plenty of people who don't see it that way. And they go to the scriptures and they say, it just doesn't match with what we see in the scriptures. So while I don't want to necessarily be contrary to those who don't believe this, I do want to be a blessing and a comfort to those who are not convinced that, you know, we're just going to escape out of here with, you know, no suffering, no persecution, no, no tribulation at all. Okay? I want to be a comfort to you. Because I don't think we're going to be here seven years. I don't think our suffering is going to last three and a half years. But I do think that for a period of five months, the church, the bride, the glorious church, the body of Jesus Christ, I think we will suffer a while. But I think during that time, Christ is going to perfect us. He's going to establish us. He's going to strengthen us. He's going to settle us. And at the end of that, I think the trumpet is going to sound. The dead in Christ shall rise. And we shall rise after them and we shall be changed. There's just one thing I'll add to this. And I'll let you go to either laugh at me, mock me, or say, you know, you've given me something to think about. Jesus told his disciples, if I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess, it's just occurred to me, I'm going to say that it's in uh, the Gospel of Mark. I may be wrong. Uh, yeah, I am wrong. But anyway, there's a passage here in Mark that talks about, These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Which, I mean, I believe that. There's another place where, and I'll find it right after I'm done recording, where Jesus told them to not be afraid of our enemies. There are enemies that are going to come against us. And he said, I'm going to give you power to tread on serpents. Serpents. I'm going to give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. And here in Revelation uh, chapter 9, those are the devils that are coming up out of the pit are scorpions and Jesus is going to give us power to tread on them and over all the power of the enemy and it won't hurt us now me I don't like scorpions and I don't like serpents or serpents but I think in such a day as is necessary God's going to bless his people and he's going to give them power to have dominion over them both. And we won't be afraid. To me, that means a lot to know that on the day that it's necessary, Christ is going to fill us. And instead of just telling us, don't be afraid, and then hoping we're not afraid, he's going to tell us, be not afraid, and we won't be afraid because the spirit that is in us refuses to be. So again, 
maybe I've made a mess of your eschatology. Then what I ask you to do is go back to the Bible, read it, find out what God says to you, all right? Maybe I didn't change your mind. Maybe I did. Or maybe these are things that you have seen already. You just weren't sure how to put it together or maybe you were afraid to even say it because the people around you, things like that just don't get said, okay? But at the end of the day, what I want is for you to get back in your Bible and open it up and say, God, your truth is in here. Will you show it to me? All right? Let my words today, as jumbled up as they are, let them be a blessing to you. And may you find comfort in the words of God. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. We'll talk about something less controversial sometime, maybe. I don't know. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.